Hey everybody, this is Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. It's our guest today, Paul Ogata. Paul is an international headlining comedian. Now, normally he'd be on the road and too darn busy to talk to us, but since there's COVID and the comedy world, as he kind of describes it, is sort of in this uh, this uh, dysfunctional vortex of who knows what's next, but it's going to come back. And right now we're trying to sort of sort that out. Anyhow, Paul comes on the show to t- talk about that. And uh, coincidentally, knows a lot about Hong Kong. He's toured there as a comedian, has friends there, and understands the politics of it. So we actually kind of venture into that area too. In- interesting dude. And I mean, it's hard to be more successful at comedy than Paul, so I know you guys will enjoy what he has to talk about. By the way, this show is produced and co-hosted by Matt Balaker. Now, Matt is a comedian in his own right and has written a book about Greg Giraldo. Uh, another thing to tell you real quick, too, is that we're doing these shows in support. We're doing these shows in support of Save the Brave. We're going to start doing some comedy shows on a fairly regular basis. And what the idea is here is we're going to start ramping up towards the opening of Bastard's Canteen, which is run by Nick Velez. You'll meet Nick in an upcoming show. But Bastard's Canteen is his uh, his restaurant chain, and he's opening a new one in Temecula. It'll have a performance space at it, and we'll be doing comedy and charity mixed together. So as we build up for that, uh, this is why we're doing these things. So this is a Save the Brave Presents Paulo Gata. Produced by Pete A. Turner, Save the Brave, and of course, Matt Balaker. So hopefully you guys will appreciate these as we do a little bit more comedy on the uh, show in support of and creating awareness for the Save the Brave charity. You guys know about that, so I don't need to plug that. And the last thing I want to say to you guys is thank you all so much for supporting. We've had our biggest month ever with the show, and I know there's just more and more great things coming. So continue to do what you're doing. Continue to use the Amazon link for BreakItDownShow.com. That will help us put a little bit of money in the coffers. And now I'm going to say to you this. Here comes Paulo Gata. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This Heath. is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> This is Paul Ogata, and you're watching the Break It Down Live Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. That's right. We are live. And I am recording from uh, Lake Arrowhead, which is fun. We have, of course, a new co-host, but someone I've been dying to get on. We've been talking about doing stuff together on comedy for months, and, and he's been a former guest on the show, Matt Balaker. Hey, Matt. Very excited. Thanks for having me, Pete. No, no, by pleasure. Tell us why we have Sir Paul Ogata on the show. Well, he's one of the best comedians we've ever seen, and he was also available this morning. So it worked out. It hit in two fronts. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll get into it. But Paul has a very broad and maybe useless, but obscure amount of knowledge in all sorts of things. So from comedy to Hong Kong to also, he's one of the smartest and most uh, intelligent people I know. So it's, it's good to have him here. Yeah, I, I agree. Let's for sure get into the Hong Kong thing, because I'm interested in that, and that's not something you're often going to hear. But first, let's talk a little bit about the state of comedy, because we just had, we were talking off mic, we just had Aries Spears on the show, and he's like, I've got a gig in Indiana this weekend, actually. He'll be in, uh, at what is it called? Not Spectrum, not Palladium. Anyhow, I'll figure out the name. Helium. That's what it was. Helium in Indiana. Chad Prather is out on the road going to places like Utah where they're a little more open for business and everything. What's the state of comedy for you right now, man? Where are you at with your uh, level of comfort to get shows? Um, how available are shows? Talk to us about where comedy is at. So that, oh. uh, you know, which, which one are you addressing? This uh, I'm addressing Paul right now, and then you okay. can definitely, definitely follow up, Matt. Sounds good. Oh, well, largely clubs and other venues have shut down. They're slowly starting to reopen. But then you're you're seeing guys like Aries Spears getting in line. I don't know if he had this gig scheduled before everything shut down, and now that they're reopening, they're just resuming their schedule. But it'll be guys that uh, are in movies or were had TV shows that will start snagging these gigs first, and that's fine. So I'll, I'll sit back and let these other comics knife fight each other for these spots until there's a, a broader opening of clubs and venues and uh, and cruise ships and or theaters. Mm-hmm. So until then, I will sit back with my dog and my wife and enjoy this downtime, this enforced downtime. (laughs) Love it when the dog shows up. Matt, what's your follow to that? 
Yeah, when would you get on a cruise ship again, Paul? That's my follow. Like, uh, what would have to happen where you would go underground with thousands of strangers and confined, poorly ventilated areas? Immediately, I would do it. No, I'm sure when they reopen, they'll have the proper protocols in place and uh, safety measures. So. I have utmost trust in their, because it's a self-serving thing for them. They want to create a safer situation for people to resume cruising. So they're not going to prematurely open and that's going to cause the complete death of their industry. I know those people and I have faith in their safety measures that they'll be implementing. So when it happens, I'm all, I'm all in, all in. And when you look at the state of the economy, you talked about maybe the industry going away or completely being redefined, where would you put us like in terms of the comedy, the live stand-up comedy industry? Is it in the ICU? Is it day to day? How would you characterize its well-being? It's more like uh, Captain Kirk in Star Trek Generations where it's in a temporal vortex and it's uh, completely removed. It's gone. Uh, it'll return at some point, but it's existing in a flux right now. I don't think it's dead. I don't think it will die. Uh, although certainly Kirk died in uh, Star Trek Generations, but that maybe that's a faulty uh, analogy. But it will it'll be back. It'll be different. You know, a man can't stand in the river without the river changing the man or man changing the river. So it'll be back. It'll be different. But rest assured, uh, there's not a shortage of broken people who need to yell opinions to alcoholics. <laughs> and no shortage of alcoholics who want to just drink on a Tuesday. Yes, oh. absolutely. <laughs> As he takes a pull off his yeah. unnamed beverage. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then just a little bit more, and then, and then Matt, take the next question. But when it comes to getting on a bigger bill, any concerns with that at all? Is there is there been a reshuffling of what it is to be a headliner or a national or international headliner? Or do you have to kind of backtrack and say, I'm willing to work, and if that means I got to, you know, open for Matt. Um, I'm, and by the way, Matt's a comedian in his own right. You know, is there a reshuffling, do you think? Yes and no. Uh, as as we see when these clubs are reopening, it's going to be the comics with a larger presence than comics with a smaller resume that are getting these gigs. So there's not a real reshuffling. And in fact, even Zoom shows, uh, comics with uh, larger resumes, they're still doing Zoom shows too. So we're all in this and it's, it's just a different delivery system of comedy. I don't think the game has significantly changed. Paul, uh, how do you think this pandemic can, if at all, help comedians or comedy in general? In terms of uh, weeding out the chaff or... That could yeah, be an example a... or, or reinventing it in a, maybe a better way or... Well, I'll tell you one thing, it's hardened me up. Now when I do Zoom shows and you don't hear laughter, I don't have the immediate need to go cry behind a dumpster anymore. You get used to the silence, which is weird because I used to do morning radio for eight years and there you have no feedback. You just shout into the void and you hope that people are listening. And so I kind of fell back on that and had to rely on that. Yeah. And then what a headliner is, again, being redefined in a different way. Like if you were already ahead of the game on Instagram, just because you worked that hard, but you weren't necessarily booking huge rooms because you didn't own theaters, right? Like those comedians that own certain theaters, they go there, they always kill. But if you killed on Instagram because you were funny on IGTV, is that making, is that redefining what that headliner is or could be? Uh, it, that's always been changing the definition of what a headliner is. Ever since social media came around, you had YouTube comedians, you had Vine comedians, you have now TikTok comedians, and they're landing or were landing theater gigs or headliner spots at comedy clubs. And then they show up and either they deliver their TikTok material and no one laughs or they draw out their fan base by the hundreds and then do their silly TikTok things and everyone leaves happy. But that's, uh, it's changing. And it's always been like that too, even before social media, a lot of the larger comic clubs were becoming less comedy clubs and more come see a famous person club where it would be a movie star coming and doing a weekend and people leave thinking that's comedy. It's a dynamic art form. Yeah, for sure. Paul, I mean, you rely, I mean, you, you do great crowd work and your interaction with the audience is fantastic, but now that you don't have that, how are you writing and what are you doing to sharpen your sword? Oh, that's, well, that's a good question. I used to write a lot on stage and come up with a basic form of an idea or joke and then take it up with me 
and unpack it there on stage. It's an incredibly inefficient way to write and perform. And I don't, I would not recommend that to anybody. That's just the way I do it. And that's how I'm wired. And so it is weird now. You're right. Uh, having to do no shows or have no audience when I do a show on Zoom. But I can still do that because with Zoom, you can still see people and sort of slowly pound your metal into a sword that way. It's slower. It's a slower process. I made this sure. thing for you, Paul, but, by the way. Your name is in lights. So oh, even on the Break It Down show, you get uh, to be, yeah, continue with your thought. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, oh, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. It, I feel like a, a discount movie. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, you. You would know. You would know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're right, Matt. It is, it's a different, it's the same process, but slower and uh, more painful. That's, that's the the essence okay. of the answer. Sorry, I had to take a picture for social media because that's all that matters anymore. You, it doesn't count. Yeah, you so reminded you. me that I had to do that <laughs> because it, the social media thing is important. I wanted to get John's question answered. John's a co-founder of the show, often co-host. He, he does his own production. So. But all the safety measures aside, where do you think audiences' sense of humor will be when we get back together? Do you think it will be awkward? Sure. No, I don't know if it'll be awkward. But it'll definitely, I think people will be hungry to laugh after all of this lockdown, after all of this stay at home measures. People want to laugh. That's the essence of being a human. We want to seek out joy. So I don't think the audience's sense of humor would be drastically different. No, I think they'll be hungrier. Poor comedy, Matt. <laughs> yeah, I think we've been cooped up for so long. And uh, they're, they're, like, as you said, they're just going to need an outlet. And uh, what better way than to? Check out Paul Gata after being cloistered for nine months. And I, 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 you know what? I, go I ahead. think it'll be even better because they'll be so eager for comedy that they'll even laugh at my stuff. So <laughs> I've done some Zoom shows, as you have too, and it seems like now it's, it's fine to joke about being in a pandemic or COVID. But once we're sort of, for using an overused term, over this, do you think... COVID will be fair game? Do you think it'll be already like just something we, we just want to forget about? Or what, what's the state of pandemic humor in your mind, Paul? Well, right, you know, it's weird. Right now, I feel it's sort of tapering off where, of what audiences want to hear as far as COVID. In the beginning, that's what everybody wanted to hear because it's the zeitgeist, man. It's, yeah. it's what we were all going through and people wanted to, to hear on that. And comics who didn't address that and did their old material just powered right through it, even though we're in the <laughs> middle of this pandemic. The, I think the Zoom audiences were less uh, inclined to appreciate that stuff. So it's a pendulum. And now as we exit the lockdown, people will still want to hear about that because well, it'll be the first time we're all together in person. But after that, I think, you know, that's why you don't hear 1917 pandemic jokes anymore. <laughs> people got tired of hearing about it. And so that's true. Point, hopefully, over you. COVID will be the same way and we'll move past this. You'll have a random joke or two, but it's like when you hear a comic going, remember Ronald Reagan? I love, Ra you know, come <laughs> on, man. You know, I got to say though, as a Ram driver, I drive a Dodge Ram. The loss of the Dodge brothers back in 1917 during this pandemic, you know, it kills still to this day. It's too soon, too soon. Uh, <laughs> Matt, do you have any more comedy questions? Do you have thoughts on comedy post COVID before we move on? I have thoughts. It kind of, what Paul said reminded me of maybe my favorite time to perform. It's usually on an election year in December or late November when everyone is just so sick of like the overdone candidate jokes yes. or politics of it. And you have to do something else. And it, it's like so refreshing. So maybe it's optimistic, but I can't wait to do a show where there are zero COVID jokes. Yeah, I guess we shouldn't get out of the comedy thing, too, before we cover the fact that a whole lot of people in this nation are pissed off and have zero sense of humor about anything, whether it's Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter, anything in between. People are fucking pissed. Is it worth your time to even go into that venue or is that your absolute responsibility as a comedian to venture into the uncomfortable and, and get people to chill the fuck out for a few minutes? I think you have it's to. It's necessary. Yeah. <laughs> it's necessary. You got to do it. Uh, people will stand outside uh, on their sidewalk and shout angrily about their, their feelings on everything. But at, when the sun goes down, they want to go have a beer and laugh. And uh, that's where Matt and I come in. We'll, we'll go to do a show at a bar or a club or whatever it is. And people go, they let their guard down for a moment. For that 90 minutes that we're on stage, 
it's uh, the world's a better place for the people in the room. Yeah, and also that's kind of the fun of it too. It's like you sort of want to see the uncomfortable side of it too and hopefully bring people together or just have a cool story you can talk about later. But I think, I mean, I've been to a lot of Paul's shows and that's one of the things I enjoy about why, I mean, on one hand, he's not afraid to be edgy, but I view his shows as like a unifying experience. Mm -hmm. I hope there's more of that. I mean, I think comedy has become so siloed and that was before COVID. I think that's maybe more a function of social media where it's like, for instance, Pat Oswald will have his fans and he's great and they're great, but you kind of know what you're going to get a little bit. And that's also a result of just building a fan base for 30 years. But I really admire comics when the audience doesn't necessarily know them, like, you know, me, and then they can unite. And I think Paul does a hell of a job with that. So check him out is my point. Yeah. Building an audience like right now or on the road, Paul, where do you like to be? Like, where do you feel you're strongest in terms of like, I need to build out a room in Kansas City, so I'm going to keep fucking going there? <laughs> or is it, I don't know. I mean, how does one do that? We're all established. Aries was talking about like, he's like, I know I'm established, but still a lot of people don't know my name. I've been in a, a world famous movie, Jerry Maguire, but I'm still doing all these things. And yet I have this incredible body of people that follow me. How do you deal with that? I mean, are you ever satisfied as a comedian? Is Kevin Hart satisfied with the size of his audience? I don't think Kevin Hart is satisfied with the size of his audience. That's what makes Kevin Hart such a force in entertainment that he's never happy with the massive success he's had. He's always wants to build on that. And I think we all of us can take a lesson from Kevin Hart's playbook on that. But far too often, and I'm guilty of it, we get complacent and we sit back and we say, okay, well, you know what? When I first started, uh, I was uh, doing open mics and I just wanted to get paid to do comedy. And so a lot of us will just take that step. And now we're good. Now I'm getting $20 and a free nachos to do comedy. And you don't progress more than that. Then the people who do get $20 and nachos and aim higher than that, a larger or the same percentage of those people are like, I'll be happy if I can just get an out of town gig. And so winnows down the field of comedians who are, uh, their hopes are outweighed by their complacency until you get to the one at top and there's Kevin Hart at the top. But at all levels of that pyramid world, there's people like me out there who want to do a little bit more than what they are doing. And then there's people like me also who, who are very happy and with not doing more, I guess. Peter, a while back, I interviewed Jim Gaffigan for a project I was working wow. on, and he had finished Madison Square Garden not that long before, and he was talking about striving for more. Like, it, 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 it's like a never-ending thing. I'm like, you just freaking did the garden, and he's already worried about, like, can I do it again? Can I either sell it out, or, or is there something? So I think it's that's sort of the unhealthy but necessary drive it takes to want to improve yourself, because there, there really isn't a top. Like, even Kevin Hart, like, I'm sure there's he probably wants to win an Oscar or ever. I'm sure there's goals ahead of him that keep him motivated. You're making me think about like any high end performer. I would say that that pyramid, that mountain that you try to get to, Kevin Hart's on top in this case. But there's also a, a mountain adjacent in the same range where you say Dave Chappelle is the greatest living comedian because he's our Carlin for this generation or whatever. So there's the artistic side where you're like really doing things that. People, and this is in no way a knock on Kevin uh, Hart because he's incredible and he's hilarious. But you look at different people and what they're great at doing. Matt wrote a book about Greg Giraldo, how great he was at roasts. People remember Dave, um, Carlin's bits because they were so mm -hmm. impactful. When you think about that, like, do you care? Are you in the saddle between the two mountains? Do you have a sense in general for yourself, either of you, or in general in the comedy world, that battle between like Fishbone as a band is the best example ever. They always make the artistic choice. They don't give a fuck about success because they do this as artists. And people care about those that know about Fishbone instantly are like, this is fucking great music. So how do both you guys deal with that conundrum of success, art, and making money and surviving? I marry a successful woman so I can be the artist. That's, <laughs> that's how I deal with that. But trophy husband yeah so you know that's we all have to make our sacrifices pete yes <laughs> what about you paul trophy husband status no uh, i'm just uh, I'm lucky to have a supportive wife and she has a job and like max <laughs> wife and so it allows us to do these things to do comedy and sure we get paid for it but it's an unorthodox situation for sure but to answer your question i think we aim for art as comedians and 
largely it's subjective. It's like saying, what's the best way to sausage to prepare sausage? And some people are like, I like it with eggs. And people are like, no, you're, you're stupid. It's best in jambalaya. But there's jambalaya is the greatest thing for the person who loves jambalaya. But for you, it might not be. So there are certain people that love Dave Chappelle, think he's the greatest. So there are certain people who love Kevin Hart, think he's the greatest. But I will tell you, when Matt is on the road or I'm on the road, we're at a club somewhere, there's going to be somebody out there who, who thinks that we are the funniest thing they've seen. And that's the beauty of live stand-up comedy is that it's a connection between people. And sometimes the connection is electric like that. Uh, you can't, there's nothing else like that. Even live music, I'll, I'll put live comedy above live music because it's a personal connection. You're having a conversation where you're the only one talking, <laughs> generally. Yes, <laughs> me, 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 me. No, but when I do shows, I like to have a conversation. I like yeah. to involve someone in the audience. It's a, I say, if it's a good show, we had a good show. Mm -hmm. I say, and it also, if it's a bad show, yeah, we we suck, not not me. It's but, always the crowd uh, that sucks. If, if the I'm crowd, comedy. yes. Yeah. After I think I said ten minutes ago that I was almost done talking about comedy, but I have another comedy question. I've always been curious about this because I think comics as a whole, you all will talk about like, you know, your version of psychosis or whatever it is that makes you want to go in front of people and lay your soul bare, but never feel great about things in general. I mean, you think about all the different comedians that are talking about their own personal therapy. Is it someone like, like Joe Piscopo comes to mind where he gets in the gym, gets into shape and it's like, he no longer needs comedy. I don't want to say he's not funny anymore, but he certainly wasn't funny anymore. Is it because he got healthy and got better? And he's like, I don't know. I, I have other things to do. What are your thoughts on comic place and state of mind where the job by itself, you end up in a bar at the end of the night and it's like, now what do I do? Oh yeah. You know, I, I just got done working. So talk a little bit about both of you talk about that. Like, is it that Joe Piscopo gets strong and healthy and better? Is it something else? What is it? You can't be funny well, with a six pack. That's what Paul said. <laughs> Comedy is not for the pretty. It's, no. uh, I don't know. There are people who are good at comedy and there are people who need to do comedy. So you find out who's <laughs> who later on. You know, Jerry Seinfeld was good at comedy, but he got successful. He's a billionaire now or close to yeah. it, but he still does comedy because he needs to do comedy. And guys like Joe Piscopo, I guess, didn't need to do it. He was, I, I don't know if he was good at stand up. I don't, I don't I've never seen him do stand up. I think he shot the fame on Saturday Night Live and then rode that little uh, special engagement at the comedy club train for quite a while. And he might be funny. I don't know. I've never seen The him, last but, uh, bit I saw him do live was, I think it was on the late night, on the late show or the Tonight Show, I think. And he was doing no shirt on, doing pull-ups with leg ups and then rotating his, and I'm like, that's not comedy. That's working out. <laughs> that was his, that was his comedy at that point. Cross a bit. That's, yeah. Well, John has another Put question. Put shirt on. <laughs> and he might have been oiled up. Could have been sweaty. Either way. <laughs> yeah, John's got a question. Have you ever really taken pleasure in absolutely obliterating a heckler? Is it as fun as it looks? Yes. That's the end of the answer. right? Great there. closed question, <laughs> yes. John. <laughs> it's Sure it is, because especially if it's a heckler who is persistent and won't won't shut up, won't listen to the audience or the, the staff or the comedian, when they obviously all vote for that person to shut up and they don't. <laughs> and so you have to come with the hammer. You don't immediately come with the hammer uh, because then you're the bad guy. But sometimes they keep pushing you and pushing you and pushing you to the point where, all right, now it's on. And so you unload. And, and they don't stay down. It's, I mean, it's like in the movie, like, stay down. And they, they, but they keep getting back up. So you have to hit them. Uh, and you have to hit them repeatedly. And yes, it feels good, John. I don't like have to do it. But if it happens, uh, oh, I, yeah. Comedian destroys heckler, I guess, is the <laughs> yeah. description for that video. Which often, by the way, a lot of those videos, comedian destroys heckler. It's not comedian destroys heckler. All right. I, I would venture to say you rarely get to see that recorded on video it's uh it's always because you know what it is it's um everything changes through observation so if you know a camera's on you as the comedian you're gonna act differently than if you didn't think there was a camera on you it's schrodinger's cat right it, it exists in a superposition quantum state of uh, it's both things until uh, you observe it then it's did you just read anyway, that story I, I of that, that quantum physics story that was there was just literally you're talking about the cat and that whole thought of, did you read that story at all or no 
No, he, what? That, that whole that whole thing was has been discussed in a quantum physics thing. It's just a news story that just came out like literally yesterday. So it's very coincidental you brought it up. So I wondered if you'd read that story at all. So your finger oh. on the pole. Well, I will say this though: a lot of people, a lot of comics will uh, misuse the that trope of Schrodinger's cat, yeah. especially in a metaphor. Where they say, "I have a Schrodinger's joke." Or do I? No, nope, you got it wrong. Because in quantum superpositioning, you have a Schrodinger's joke, and you also at the same time do not have a Schrodinger's joke. That's how quantum superpositioning works. I love it. Duh. <laughs> so uh, Paul has done a bunch of uh, military shows. How did you get into that world? I was fascinated by that kind of stuff. I was a kid. My dad would take me to see air shows, and you'd see the military jets fly by, and you're like, ah, oh, wow, that isn't. That's all pretty cool. And when you're a kid, you see war movies. And you're like, oh, wow, I want to see all that stuff. And I never served. So I never, I didn't get to see that stuff close up. And so when the opportunity to get on a, a USO tour popped up, I jumped on it immediately because I wanted to see all that stuff. And uh, I did get to see some pretty cool things doing shows for the military over the years. Uh, top secret stuff, riding in tanks or in as a b2 stealth bomber took a picture climbing into a harrier uh, landing on an aircraft carrier it's a, yeah that was pretty fun but over the course of seeing all those things i got to meet the people i got to meet the the men and women in uniform and that's far more of an amazing experience for me than seeing any of the other stuff was than getting to fire machine guns or throw grenades or whatever, but meeting the real people doing the most difficult things that we ask them to do, that we task them to do in impossible situations. And they all have unique s stories. And it's that's what really draws me back. I'll go back anytime, any place where we have men and women in uniform at whether it's domestically internationally in a war zone i'll go back my wife told me not to but you know jewelry um, um, <laughs> but yeah, wherever they are i'll go it doesn't and people always say thank you for doing what you do paul i'm like no yeah. i don't do anything I, I show up and i eat their food that's all i do but it's my way of saying thank you yeah, yeah, and I'll, as I'll a guy on. that's received those comedy shows, it's great. It's great to have someone come. Even if it's often hard, like as an audience, we're really far removed a lot of times. We're spread out because, you know, whatever, a lot of us are just passing by. Like, it's almost like you're doing stand-up in a really dangerous mall. <laughs> I always took time to stop and then, you know, appreciate and be in the mood to laugh. Sometimes you're just so fucking tired, like, that's funny. That's funny. So <laughs> just... To fly halfway across the world, to fly into a dangerous place and to go, I, you know, I always, I can speak for all of us. We always love it. We appreciate it. We had um, Robin Williams, J uh, John Elway, uh, a hot chick. I can't remember her name right now off the top of my head. And then the guy who was the, uh, the super Creole guy from Waterboy, Leanne, um, what's her name? Leanne, I can't remember her last name. No, no, no. So, yeah, yeah. Leanne Sweden. She came out. And so- Robin Williams, hilarious. The Creole guy who was in Waterboy was hilarious. Leanne Tweeden did her job on Hot and signed things. And John Lowe was like, I'm not funny. I'm not good looking. <laughs> but I could throw footballs. And so he just started hucking footballs around the audience. You know, <laughs> It's just great, man. So even if you just do it out of the goodness of your heart, it works. It, it's such a great break. We had Billy Blanks came way out. To, I was in a super distant remote camp. And Billy Blanks came out and gave us a workout. And uh, as ridiculous as it seems, and it was, God damn, that dude got on a plane and he went to where he must have said, take me to where nobody ever goes. And then he showed up all motivated and sweaty. And we we're like, fuck, yeah, man, this is all right. We'll work out with you. And it was awesome. So definitely tell your wife. It means a lot to all of us when you guys, even if you just go to Kuwait or something like that, if you don't go to Afghanistan, go do it because it is it's really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, listen, I see the gratitude. They, uh, we showed up at the, some fob or in the middle of nowhere and Shindan, I think. And the guys there built a stage, spray painted a sign that says Shindan Improv. Right. They made it into a comedy club for the show. It was wonderful. I can't remember the name of the, this cop command outpost in the middle of nowhere in Afghanistan. We showed up and every day, every day at 3 p.m., the Taliban yep. would launch shells at them, mortar uh, shells at them. And it, it, every day at 3 p.m. So we go, we, we fly all the way out there to the middle of nowhere. And what time do they schedule the show? 2.45. Uh, <laughs> Come in, 3.45, maybe 4. <laughs> yeah. 
Three oh five when the show stops. Maybe skip. No, two forty five. That's when the show happens. So of course, in the middle of the show, uh, sirens go off. Incoming, Incoming. Take yeah. Cover, take yeah. Cover. Okay. There's not many things more terrifying than have your mind kind of wander and all of a sudden you hear incoming, 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 and you're like, ah, <laughs> right. what do I do? And then a lot of times the answer is just lay flat on the ground. And then you find out that a mile and a half away, some mortar shells came in, and you're like, I laid on the ground for that. Damn it. <laughs> Well, sometimes it's oh, close, yeah. though. Like we were in Kandahar, <laughs> yeah. and in the middle of the show, incoming, incoming. And everyone, because you guys are well-trained, get down on the ground, and you're supposed to open your mouth in case the thing explodes nearby, your yeah. eardrums don't burst. And everyone, no one told me that, but you see everybody <laughs> falling to the ground like this. Yeah. Ah! And I'm like, wait, what, what's happening yeah. here? Uh, no one told me anything about this. And of course, at the time, there was another comedian on stage, Phil Palisol, very funny guy out of Denver. And so... the uh, couple of army guys jump up on stage and cover him to protect him. But I'm standing up in the back of the room. No one's, no one's. You're Asian. What's You're Asian. It... Oh, wait, what does that have to do with You're a tunnel rat. You just dig a hole in this cave. We <laughs> thought you were against us. We were hoping. Yeah. Hilarious. Yeah, it's true. So this is how funny these kind of things are just for the audience. You know, I'm walking across a parking lot with my boss one day. We're inside a camp, so it's relatively safe. So we're not all, all armored up. We're just wearing regular clothes. And as we're walking, a AK-47 round just goes and just bounces next to us. We look down and we're like, and it was the thing could have hit us and it wouldn't have broke skin or anything. Maybe at worst, may, maybe put a bruise, but like it, like it was just out of energy. But literally, some guy somewhere shot around in the air, and we were at the other end of that, however far away that was, because we didn't hear a gunshot. And those are the kind of things that happen. And as a, as a comedian that goes on these kind of tours, you experience these things. You're like, hey, look, there's a giant bomb hole over there. Let me go stand in that. And then you stand in the bomb hole and make a funny face or whatever. But tell me you got that and you made it into a, a necklace or something that you picked it up. I, I don't remember what we did with it. Yeah, it's stuff like that happens, though. Like maybe Bruce Bruce was the guy walking next to me. Maybe he grabbed it. Maybe we just left it on the ground. I don't know. But I've certainly grabbed things around. I'm like, holy shit, look at this thing. You move and you're like, ah, it's just a piece of metal. But yeah, you're right. Like those things are things that you grab and go, this bullet, we almost got shot by this bullet. Because I'm sure there's a lot of guys or gals that send brass home. You know, they got the empty uh, shell cases that they send. I got some of yeah. that sitting in upstairs. But at least the bad guys don't have depleted uranium. So you can pick yeah. it up, right? If you're not going to be. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about Hong Kong because it's interesting that you've got that. You've got that experience. And look, it's a really confusing place for those of us that aren't savvy to that. And, and you know, it's like we only worry about our own conflict here. And we tend to think that our conflict is the worst ever of all times. But it turns out people in Hong Kong are fighting for, for freedom or for acquiescence, depending on which side they're on. What do you know about how can you make us smarter about Hong Kong? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. But it turns out people in Hong Kong are fighting for, for freedom or for acquiescence, depending on which side they're on. What do you know about how can you make us smarter about Hong Kong? Well, and it kind of circles back to an earlier topic we covered or a question you had about building your audience. I, I've been doing shows in Hong Kong since 2004. I've been flying out there sometimes three times a year to do shows. Uh, this is actually the first year in 17 years that I am not doing shows in Hong Kong for at, at various reasons. As as you know, the COVID thing and also the, the mass protests, that really put a, a clamp down. Last time I was there in last November, when I was doing shows, I, I got I broke out in hives because of all of the tear gas in the air. And it was, Jeez. I didn't even touch anything. Just walked down the street and all of a sudden uh, I'm covered in hives. But that's the reality that the Hong Kongers are facing right now. A lot of people have a short memory on what Hong Kong is. People think, well, the Chinese took it from the Brits. Well, no, the, the British people handed it back because the British people had it for 100 years. Why did they have it for 100 years? Because of the opium wars. And uh, the British wanted to do commerce, do trade with the Chinese. The Chinese, however, said, no, just keep buying our tea and we'll make all the money. And so the British are like, well, what can we do to get money out of this country? So they introduced opium. They gave them drugs. And so uh, this was, uh, yeah, it went gangbusters. They made their money that way. But pretty soon, uh, conflict broke out on, uh, on 
the drug use and uh, that illicit trade. And so the British took over uh, Hong Kong. They took Macau, went to the Portuguese, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Slowly, Britain extended the landmass of Hong Kong by leasing space in the new territories from China on the mainland side. I think that was the problem with Britain. If they hadn't leased this territory, which they had to give back at some point, Hong Kong was theirs in perpetuity. So they could have held on to it. But by expanding the footprint of Hong Kong into a rented space, at that point, they really had no choice. So that's the situation that Hong Kongers face now. China, in the joint agreement with the UK, was supposed to keep a two systems, one country thing in place where Hong Kong would have relative democracy until 2047. But that's obviously fallen by the wayside. That's sadly where a lot uh, uh, we find ourselves. Yeah. Paul, what happened? And I know obviously the, the Daryl Morey tweet about a year ago kind of brought this to life in the U.S. But what happened more recently that made the tensions rise so much there? In Hong Kong? Well, in Hong Kong and China. mainland. Oh, OK. The, uh, there is a guiding principle in Hong Kong law, uh, the basic law, which is sort of like a constitution. China, mainland China, communist China, wanted to introduce a, a new law, security law, where people could get extradited out of Hong Kong into mainland China and vanished and without due process. And of course, the people in Hong Kong were upset about that. They didn't want that to happen. What if you could be walking down the street in, near Arrowhead and then they put a bag on your head and now you're in China? Yeah, you don't want no. that, right? Of course Probably not. not. So, I mean, unless you do, because uh, maybe you like uh, dim sum. Maybe you like that Shanghainese <laughs> dumpling with the I soup do. in it. I happen to love that. Not that they'll have a lot of that in the gulag in the prison that you'll be at, but you know. And then on top of that, the uh, the Hong Kong chief executive, they don't have a president or a prime minister. It's a person called the chief executive who is elected freely in Hong Kong from amongst a, a slate of candidates selected by communist China. So it's always going to be somebody who kowtows, part of the uh, pun, to mainland China. And so Carrie Lam, that's the woman who's running Hong Kong now, did nothing exacerbate the tensions by having police in Hong Kong brutally attack the citizens there. And it's it's documented on videos and it's, it's easy to see if you go and look it up online. So the people saw that. They said, all right, can you dial it back? And she said, nope, this is how it is, basically. <laughs> and protesters, even before China implemented the security law, were they vanished. They're put on trains and taken to mainland China. People who owned a bookstore that sold books espousing freedom and independence from China were vanished and uh, taken to, uh, ostensibly, I guess, re-education camps in China. That's what happened, Matt. That, that's what the people showed up in the hundreds of thousands out there to protest. It was an amazing sight to see. Then people, students took up positions at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University and other universities there, too, and staged holdouts against the police where the cops came in with weapons and tear gas. Which, by the way, did you know that in America, we are not allowed to use tear gas against enemies? can't use that in war. It's, it's part of the... Only on your own. <laughs> yeah. But, but here, the cops can just... Uh, Only in a protest it's, or Waco, Texas or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't understand uh, the standard. It either lets everybody have tear gas. Why I can't, Why can't I have tear gas? You know, the only person going to stop a bad guy with tear gas and a good guy with tear gas. More right? tear gas. So Absolutely. let me ask you a question about Hong Kong then in general. Do are they legitimately called the Hong Kongers? Is that the uh, what do you ever call the name that you call someone, or are they the Hong Kongese, or or what do you what is the actual name? Is it Hong Konger? Hong Kongonesianers is not the correct term. They like to call themselves Hong okay. Kongers. And, and who decides uh, this thing? Like, to... Who decided Seattleites and Los Angelinos and then Phoenicians? Phoenicians because you're from Phoenix. It's just weird. Anyhow. No, you're right, though. You're right. Why is it you're Canadians from Canada and not Canadians from Canada? These are important questions that this podcast That's seeks right. to answer. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, do you think of people from Phoenix as Phoenicians? Have you ever used that term out loud? Why don't they use that term? They, uh, I don't know. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah, thanks for bringing this up. <laughs> These are the things I think about. 
Why are people from Glasgow Glaswegians? That's a good one. <laughs> are they really Glaswegians? Or did you make that? Glaswegians, yeah. yes. Because they, they want nobody to say that word ever. Yeah. And then like Afghans are called Afghans, not Afghanis. And yet we all say Afghanis. And they even say Afghanis because they care less than we do. We're like, no, you can't call them Afghanis. They're like, I am Afghani. You know, it's like they just move on with it. Uh, the folks in Hong Kong, where do you think they are? Like, do they want to be free? Do they merit the support of you know, what we would call the five eyes, the U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, New Zealand? Is this something that we wade into? Or, or is this inevitable conclusion going to be that they become Chinese? It has always been the inevitable conclusion. At the end of the, the handover agreement, the term of that agreement from the U.K. to China, Hong Kong becomes Chinese. That's it. It becomes a part of China. But there are a lot of people, especially the younger people who have now, they were born into freedom. Prior to 1997, if you were born in, or, or rather after, anyway, I don't know what my point is. <laughs> a lot of the younger people, all they know is freedom. They know uh, the internet. In China, you can't get on Facebook. You can't use Google. But in Hong Kong, which is a special administrative region, SAR, of China, you can do all these things. Uh, at, well, not anymore. I think they're clamping down more and more. Obviously, you can get around these uh, with the VPNs, the virtual private network software, which is, has been a godsend to me every time I've been in mainland China doing shows. China clamps down on what you can read, what you can hear, and uh, that's what Hong Kong will has always been inevitably moving towards. The question is, will China respect the agreement they made with the UK about the length of the transition? And it seems like the answer is no. And people are upset about that. Why does China want more Gee, problems? What I mean, they have, I always like to say, like they have a middle class that's bigger than the entire population of the US and they demand more things. They want higher quality things. They want electricity. Why would China want to even mess around with an extra problem like Hong Kong? Everyone's the hero of their own story. And, you know, in China, what they view Hong Kong as, what they view Taiwan as, is theirs. And it's historically theirs is, is how they view it. In fact, they, they cause a lot of problems with the United States when we support Taiwan, when we uh, sell weapons to Taiwan. China views that as an encroachment on their own sovereignty. It's an internal problem is what they like to say. To us, it seems China has no, not morals, but has no regard for international laws because they operate from a viewpoint where they're uh, following their own laws. For example, here's why in America and a lot of countries we have problems with China. China goes and finds a part of the ocean where there's no China. And then they start building more yeah. China there. And then people wake up the next day, they're like, holy shit, China's closer. <laughs> and that should be China's motto, China coming soon. <laughs> that should, that's what it should be. But Paul, how did you learn so much about this? Is it a combo of Reddit and visiting? Or, I mean, it's, it's great hearing this, but uh, how did you become so knowledgeable on, on this subject? Well, it's uh, like I said, I've been going to Hong Kong for 17 years doing shows. I've, I've been to China many times, doing, mainland China, many times doing shows, Taiwan doing shows, and Macau. So you, you see things on the ground that you are privy to here in the States. You don't get to see what's going on. You don't get to hear from real people what's going on. And then it piques your curiosity. And from there, you do read uh, sometimes on Reddit, sure, or sometimes <laughs> on, on Wikipedia. Or another, any other ways that you can get information, it creates a hunger in you. Travel is good because you then begin to broaden your horizons and see things and learn and want to learn more about the world which is, uh, I don't know, it's kind of the bane of COVID, right? Uh, <laughs> it, is that it shuts down travel. But this world got to a point, and I think the world is fixing itself, right? Excessive travel was such a problem. It created pollution. And it also was the vector for transmission of this coronavirus that enabled this local disease to become a global pandemic. But now because of this global pandemic, excessive travel has been curtailed. So the earth, I think, is somehow... <sighs> healing itself yeah interesting yeah the earth is huge so thank you for coronavirus and what paul got us says <laughs> thanks for yeah, well listen you think i'm being facetious but this year started with a candles that smelled like gwyneth paltrow's yes. vagina and then now we're in a global pandemic where one of the symptoms is loss of sense of smell do you see, see what i'm saying so, now? it's full circle mm -hmm. thank you wow the world is fixing itself. That was quantum mechanics yeah. stuff. Schroeder's cat just meowed. 
<laughs> in that box. Um, okay, so I'm letting jokes go by because I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get in trouble. Um, okay, so the Hong Kong situation. Did you? What else fascinates you? I mean, Hong Kong is one thing, but and, and then how the hell did you build an audience in Hong Kong that wants to heck, wants to see you? Like, how does one even do that? Not that you're not good, but like you don't live anywhere near Hong Kong. It's a uh... Tenacity, you know, it's just showing up. Couldn't you be tenacious in Phoenix? It's closer. (laughs) (laughs) I could, I could. But I don't have a friend who owns a comedy club. Uh A friend of mine moved from New York City to Hong Kong and opened a comedy club there. But prior to that, he would brought me and some other comedians out there to do shows. And then he saw that there was a market for it. Prior to his club, there wasn't a full-time comedy club in Hong Kong, in all of Asia, in fact. But he had a vision and he built a comedy club there. And it's been running since uh, 2005, 2006. I really see that club, the Takeout Comedy Club, as sort of uh, the the impetus for the explosion of comedy in that region. Prior to that, you had an outfit called, uh, I don't know, it was a British guy who was doing shows at an Indian restaurant in Hong Kong a few times a year. That was the extent of the comedy scene in Hong Kong and Asia pretty much. It was the same guy that took them around to different restaurants. But once this uh, friend of mine opened a club in Hong Kong. And it's called the Takeout Comedy Club? Is that what it is you said? Yeah, Takeout Comedy Club in Soho, Hong Kong, 35 Elgin Street, and 6220, I don't know the whole phone number. Anyway, (laughs) yeah, it became a base, a home for comedy there. And uh, now there's healthy scenes in Singapore. There's healthy scenes in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. There's healthy scenes in Jakarta, Indonesia, Bangkok, Thailand. Takeout comedy, I think, uh, inspired kung fu comedy in China. And they had a string of shows, a tour that you could do that that went all over Beijing, Nanjing, Shanghai, uh, all over China. And of course, now the government shut that operation down because uh, they don't want Westerners doing comedy in mainland China. Yeah. How do they, what do they feel about it in Hong Kong? Like, is your, is your buddy getting roughed up? Is he getting letters? The guys in leather jackets come by and say no more? Yeah, they, he got the authorities clamped down on him uh, about a year and a half ago. And so he had to move to a different format where he can't do public shows. Now they're private shows. But actually, up until last week, maybe Live Nation had a comedy club there since the beginning of this huh. year. And then they weren't able to sustain it because of the coronavirus, uh, obviously, and the protests. But my friend had, was dug in at that point, and he, he still operates his club. What is a private show versus public? What's the distinction? Uh, he's not allowed to sell tickets at the door. It has to be a, a private, you know, like an invitation thing, which and there's ways around that, I guess. But it's just the government's way of trying to get you to stop, making it so hard for you, throwing up so many roadblocks that you quit just by attrition and like, all right, I, this is not worth my uh, time and effort to keep doing this, which is what happened with the other, the riff in Hong Kong, the Live Nation Club. I guess there are too many obstacles to get around and they couldn't sustain it because uh, they're not there on the ground. Yeah, you, know? you got to be there. It's a multinational And is company. your buddy benefiting from this clampdown? Because that would make me want to go there like big fuck you to the man. No matter where you are, no matter who the man is, whether they're in Man King or Nan King, you're like, yeah, I'm going to go to this club. I'm going to spend some money on this. Uh, it is open. I think you can uh, check out takeoutcomedy.com and uh, you'll see what, if and when there are shows scheduled. You'll see. It's a vibrant scene. There's a lot of very talented comics in that city. You won't be disappointed. And John wanted to know. Uh, is he benefiting yeah. from it? Is he it? benefiting from it? Uh, I don't think he's benefiting okay. from it. I don't think he is. It's uh, obviously cramping his uh, business. And then John wanted to know why was Asian culture so ripe for a comedy explosion? It's not that Asian culture was ripe for it, but they had not had American style English language stand-up comedy. Stand-up existed in some form everywhere. In China, it was called crosstalk. Whereas, very, oh, hold on, yeah. my dog's eating my charger. Uh, <laughs> uh, they had a thing called crosstalk in China, mainland China, where it was uh, kind of like Abbott and Costello, two guys just talking with each other. <laughs> and that was what they had. They didn't have what we do, what Matt and I do, what Aries Spears does. They didn't have that there. But over time, now people can see clips on the internet uh, of American-style stand-up comedy yeah the interest for it grew and it was untapped market so it was less a factor of culture than it was of geography i guess and are the crowds there paul mostly expats or locals or what's the mix in the audience 
It's like the United Nations, man, in Hong Kong. When I'm doing shows there, you got people from the Netherlands in the crowd. You got people, local Chinese from Hong Kong. You've got Brits, Americans, Canadians. It's it's like that scene in the, the Star Wars prequels where you're in the, the M, not the Empire, but then yeah. the Republic chamber. And there's a, everyone from different pods are from different parts of the galaxy. And that's the beautiful thing about doing shows in Hong Kong is that you get that. Uh, it's not the case throughout the region in Malaysia, when you're doing shows in uh, Kuala Lumpur, for example, it's a lot of locals. It's a lot of uh, local Malays or local Chinese, but it's local people coming to the shows there in KL. It's like in America, different cities produce different audience demos. In Iowa, you're going to get Iowans probably, but uh, in LA, you get people from all over. And then Asia is a big place. And if you've played in Kuala Lumpur, you're not within thousands of miles of playing in Tehran. What's the black room? What's a black room equivalent in Asia? Like, where are you like, oh man, when you go here, you got to perform a different kind of comedy because it just Hong Kong comedy won't play there. Well, <laughs> I don't, you mean in the region or in no, the No, I mean city? in the continent. It's like a- if you're in Israel, I'm sure they have comedy there. But if you're in Tehran, different kind of comedy. And if you're in Bangladesh, different kind of comedy. And if you're in Mongolia, different kind of comedy. So, like, do you have any kind of sense for regionally what it's like? I mean, you said Malay, it's a lot of locals. but Well, yeah. Listen, I did a show in Pakistan. The, at the time, the, the producer said it was the first public English language show. I often get roped into doing these guinea pig shows. Uh, for some <laughs> now we're getting uh, somewhere. First time ever we're doing a show here. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, we'll have nachos. I'm in. <laughs> That's my goal. I'm like Mikey eating the cereal. He'll <laughs> eat it. He's in. You'll get different cultural situations, different governmental situations. In Malaysia, they issued me a list of 17 things I was not supposed to talk about on a radio uh, show or even broach the subject of things like politics, religion crime or whatever it is so there's the government will tell you what you can and cannot do i've done shows in singapore and malaysia where the government will show up during my show their special branch of their police wing will show up and say oh what's that guy talking about and they'll they'll take notes while i'm on stage and it's kind of creepy but so far i haven't been thrown into a prison (laughs) overseas locked up overseas when i was in pakistan you would think that in pakistan when i went the state department told me do not go my wife told me, do not go to Pakistan. My parents flew from Hawaii to California to tell me not to go to Pakistan. And I get it. I get it. It seems like it's a dangerous place. But when I got there, uh, <laughs> obviously, all local Pakistani people there, and they loved it. The shows were amazing. There's really no black room. There's no places that you have to substantially change your act. Uh, obviously, little tweaks here and there. Like in mainland China, they, you cannot address the three T's, uh, Tiananmen Square, uh, Tibet, and Taiwan. You cannot. Oh, thank God. Titties things. are not on the list. Uh, I, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, those are two things. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, man. <laughs> um, all right. So everybody should definitely go check out Paul Ogata at paulogata.com. Fortunate for you to get your own name as your uh, URL. That's fantastic. Shows coming soon, as soon as he can be guinea pigged into something. Well, I'll tell you what, you, you would need a dose of uh, whatever it is the hell I do. On Emmy night on ABC, this is September 20th, check out the Emmys. But before that, it's, uh, the lead into that is uh, Celebrity Family Feud. And uh, you can catch hey. me on that. Uh, yeah, Brad Garrett is a friend of mine, so he asked me to come and be on his team. So it's me and a bunch of other comedians and Brad Garrett versus Ray Romano. So it'll, it'll be a, an actual, well, fake family feud on Celebrity <laughs> Family Feud. September 20, ABC, right before the end. Perfect. Check yeah, it out. for sure. And then you said Ray Romano. Do you ever go play, uh, after you do Ray's Room in Vegas, do you ever go play the Dirty at 1230 over at, uh, the, I think it's at South Coast? Yes, uh, I've, I've been there. Gabe's yeah, a Gabe's friend of good mine, dude. Gabe Lopez, the guy who runs that thing. Yeah. And uh, he, it's an amazing show oh he's my put God. together. Yeah, it's it is. Uh, 1230 yeah, it's at great. night. You wouldn't think anything's happening. And yet he packs out this showroom at the yeah. South Point. And the, the the ass end of the strip, and uh, people come out in droves to see comedy with no filter. Yeah, no, it is great. Uh, any last questions, Matt? How did you learn the correct pronunciation of Pakistan? I don't even think I I don't know if I'm saying it correct. I never said Pakistan, and and you you showed me the right way. So you're clearly more culturally literate. So my hat's off to you. No, I, I don't know if that's correct or not, but I will say this as Americans, we don't give a shit about how people say things. We say it our own way. 
uh, <laughs> so maybe I'm saying it wrong. Maybe I'm saying it correct. But I, I like I, how you're saying. I don't it. care. Yeah, there's not really a. Is, and is that there's not really a p sound in Arabic? So if an Arabic pronunciation it would be like Pakistan, but I'm not saying it right either. And like you said, let's just call it Pakistan and be done with it. Are you Pakistanis? Or, or there's that uh, Middle Eastern country. There's that country in the Middle East called uh, Qatar, <laughs> which as Americans we're like, you go to Qatar. 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 Yeah. Qatar. Yeah. Yeah. Or if they slow down, they'll say Qatar. <laughs> like like saying it slower makes it better. Qatar. <laughs> hey, man. Yeah, that's 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 our go-to as Americans. When if people don't understand us, we just use yeah. louder English. I love how President Trump <laughs> says no, no, China. He did, he can't, it's the shortest word ever, and he can't say it. China. Yeah. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on. Let's do another one soon. I know John wants to chat with you. I, I thought he was going to be busy today. I should have invited him, but I guess he was available. So my bad, John. I apologize. Uh, everybody should definitely go to paulogata.com. Check out his stuff wherever you are. Always go check out the Family Feud. But in general, check it out before the, what was it, the Emmys you said? That was going to be the, pre, the thing we evening. September 20, right before the Emmy, Celebrity Family Feud. Perfect. All right. Thanks, man. 